Hello everyone, I'm Jim Staley, Passion for Truth Ministry, and welcome to today's broadcast. I pray that you are having an amazing day, and I pray this message blesses you. Today's message is going to be on an interesting topic. Some of you have maybe never heard uh, a preacher or a pastor or a Bible teacher talk on this topic before, but because of today's day, because of the, the times that we're living in, it's necessary that we tackle this. And what's today's topic? Should Christians be cursing? Is it okay to curse? Is it a sin to use profanity as a Christian? We're gonna talk about all of that and more. We really have two camps. We've got the camp that says that words are just words and that there, it's, there's no sin involved. And then there's the camp that says curse words or profanity is a sin, absolutely without question. Let's dive into the Bible and find out what God has to say right after this. All right, first and foremost, if you're not subscribed to this channel, would you please take five seconds and hit subscribe and turn on the notification so you don't miss any videos that come out, any teachings that come out here at Passion for Truth Ministries. And do us a favor and share this. As you share this and as you comment below in the comment section, it turns on the algorithm of YouTube and it helps us be found uh, found a lot quicker in the, in the YouTube search engine. So please help us out and do that if you can. All right, here we go. When we're talking about cursing, we're not talking about actually putting curses on people. We're talking about profanity. So that's what we really are going to be zeroing in on. Although I will be talking about the ancillary uh, subject of talking harshly, that our words matter, the power of our words that come out of our mouth. Everything that we say and do, ladies and gentlemen, as ambassadors of the living Christ matters. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. All right. So, and by the way, uh, the t-shirt that I have on right now, if you hold on till near the end of this, this teaching, this broadcast, I'll share with you why I'm wearing it, what it says, and how it can relate to us and our tongues today. And uh, so just hold on. And I uh, might even share with you how you can get one. Okay. All right. Here we go. First of all, there is... In the It's Just Words crew, they have several arguments or things that we're going to talk about. We're going we're gonna to dissect a little bit and see if there's any merit. The first one is, is there are no scriptures in the Bible that says that we cannot use profanity. So we're going to pull up a ton of scripture today. I love the Bible. The Bible is our standard. And we're going to discover, is that true? Is there no scriptures that talk about uh, our tongues and, and how we use them properly or improperly? Number two... Uh, I hear this a lot is, hey, show me a list in the Bible of words that we're not allowed to say. Okay, we're going to talk about that. Is that a straw man argument? I'm going to suggest that it is, and uh, we'll unpack that as well. Lastly, well, third to last, words aren't evil. It's all about the intent of the heart. It's all about the context of how you use those words, whether or not profanity is okay. There's a whole group of people believe that it's okay to curse as long as you're not doing it to hurt someone or harm someone or demean someone. Their argument is it's all about the intent of the heart. And so lastly, uh, there are some group of people that believe that, hey, look, sometimes it's the only way to get somebody's attention and you have to use uh, profanity to, to, to gather and garner uh, their attention. So as strange as that might sound, that is an argument that's out there and I think it's important to address all of those. One of the questions that we're going to answer today is, is there any time that profanity is okay? Is there a time generically that we're allowed to curse? We're going to answer that question, I promise you, by the time of this broadcast is, is finished. I love this quote by Dr. Andrew Newberg. He's a neuroscientist at Thomas Jefferson University. And Mark Robert Waldman, they both wrote a book together called Words Can Change Your Brain. And they said this, a single word has the power to influence the expression of genes that regulate physical and emotional stress. A single word can change the entire chemistry of your body starting in your brain, can affect your hormones, your cortisol levels, your physical stature, your emotion. Everything can be manipulated through one single word. So is this topic important today? I would suggest it is absolutely paramount since the entire universe was created by a word, the word of God. 
created the universe, and he began the entire process with a word. And it, it started maybe behind that with a thought, but it ended up in word, and those words became something of substance. Our words matter, ladies and gentlemen. This topic is incredibly important. When we're living in a world that is falling apart at its seams, ethics, morality, sexual promiscuity, all at its high, today the standard of the church that calls themselves the church of God is lower by far than the standard of the world 50 years ago. Did you know that? That 50 years ago, the world's standard on television is so much higher than a Christian's standard today, and it should not be that way. We are slowly allowing the world to impact us and to influence us, and that's why we've got to get to the bottom of this, because this is not connected to just your mouth, just your tongue, just words, just profanity, that simple question of should Christians curse or not. This is connected to how we live our lives as believers. This is connected to who we are, the frequency that we put off, the image of the living God that's supposed to come through us. This topic and how we view topics like this matter to everything and every theological doctrine and creed that we can come up with because it's how we process. And I'm going to suggest this is not about the written absolute do's and don'ts. This is about, about discovering the heart of God. So let's do that right now. So many times, and speaking of that, so many times people want the answers. You know, they'll write me and, and they'll say, hey, uh, Jim, can you give me the answer on this? Give me the answer on that. And they're looking for scripture for their particular question or their concern, and that's great. But there's a lot of times, would you, would you agree with me, that scripture does not address a specific issue here in the 21st century. It can kind of be gray. So what we really want to do is know the heart of God. When we know his heart, we know his mind, we take scripture in total context from Genesis to Revelation, we discover what his original intent and purpose is, what he's really trying to accomplish in the earth realm, and through each individual family group, the, the region, national, and global interest of the church, when we totally understand his heart, these type of topics become uh, incredibly easy to understand. Even if we don't have an exact verse that says, thou shall not use profanity, we can understand his heart when we know his word in context. And that's what we're going to do. So let's start off with James chapter 1, verse 26. I like this quote. I think it's a, apropos to start this entire message with this. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Listen to what James says here. Now, James is the president. He's the Nazi of the Jerusalem Council of the Messianic Church in the first century. And he makes this statement, says, look, if you think you're religious and you don't know how to bridle your tongue, you don't know how to control your tongue, you don't know how to, to, to reel it back, but you just let it go, one, he makes this brilliant statement. He, he could have just skipped that and said, your religion's worthless. But he didn't say that. He has one phrase in there that's extraordinarily powerful. He says, you're deceiving yourself. Don't call yourself a believer in the living God and his Christ, but you have no ability to tame or to control your tongue. And I'm speaking to me as well, because my I speak for a living. I'm a quick processor. Sometimes I speak before I think. I think every single teacher I ever had in grade school, including my mom and my grandmother, would say, Jim, if you would just think before you speak, right? And I think all of us could use that, that encouragement, that instruction that we need to bridle our tongue. It cannot just be uh, the instrument of our brain. Everything that we think should not come out of our mouth. Amen? We want to make sure that our religion is useful. And James starts off his entire book by saying, it all starts right here. It all starts with what you say. Proverbs 18.21 says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. It doesn't say if you love death, you'll, it says death and life are in the power of the tongue, 
and those who love it will eat its fruit. So however you, whatever comes out of your mouth, that's what you're eating. How ironic. The words that come out are the very words that you will eat. So when you bless someone, you will receive blessing. When you curse someone, and that can be through sarcasm, demeaning, making fun of, joking, all of those things, mean statements, or even profanity, you will eat the very same thing that comes out of your mouth. I love the word picture. Sometimes we just have to break it down. We, we pass the intellectual black and white and red in the original language and just let the word picture speak for itself. I love this. It says, our thoughts become our words. I wrote this down and I thought, man, I, I, this, this, this has impacted me as I was praying through this. Our thoughts become our words and our words define the very frequency of who we are. Let me say that again. Our thoughts become our words and our words define the very frequency of who we are. In other words, the power of the tongue is so extraordinarily powerful. It creates a language that affects the frequency of your very body. Like I, I said earlier, a quote by the neuroscientist that a single word changes the brain. It physically changes the brain and alters every chemistry in your body. If that's the case, then words are creative. Everything that we say becomes what we do. Everything that we think becomes a language that is around us. What language do you speak? What language do you want people to hear? It's not about profanity. It's about a frequency. As ambassadors of the Most High God, we are literally the, the examples of His face on earth. When Moses came down from the mountain, His face glowed because He was in the presence of God. People didn't see anything but His face. If He wasn't wearing shoes, nobody would know. If somebody went back in time and gave Him a pair of, of Nike high tops and Jordans, no one would even recognize it because the glow was so great coming from His face. That's all they saw. We as believers, my friends, this is what people should see from us, is the glow from being in the presence of God. And it starts with what we say. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 through 32, probably one of the most detailed and powerful verses on this subject that we could cover. Read it with me. It says this in the New King James, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ has forgiven you. My friends, this could not be any clearer. It says this again, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking is, well, how do you define what's corrupt? I'm going to suggest to you that corrupt is in profanity, profane, uh, those words, that, that the profanity that we have today that's defined today, because you are right. Some of you are thinking, uh, Jim, there, every culture defines profanity different. One word over here might mean a curse word in another language. That's exactly right. So your question is, well, who gets to define what a curse word is? We're going to learn the heart of God, and you won't even have to ask that question. But the short answer is society defines, and it's very clear in every culture, what is profanity. We don't have to say, well, God didn't decide it. No, if man decides that this is inappropriate and offensive, okay, as profanity, and the entire Christian world agrees with that, then we have now defined something that allows us to enter into a heart of God frequency that we need to stay away from. Anything that is defined by our society as unholy and profane, and the church by at large agrees that it's unbiblical, ungodly, or it's hurtful, or it's profanity, I, I think it's just wise to stay away from it. I'm going to show you a scripture where wisdom needs to be used, not black and white. 
okay? Because some of you are, I think like me, you're very black and white, got to be found in scripture. I'm telling you, it is in scripture. You're just black and whiteness is allowing you to be blinded by the heart of God and the color that is very much there, just looking in the wrong spot. So let's continue and go a little bit further. Ephesians chapter 5, 3 and 4 says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as it is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse je joking, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Now, I, I'm going to kind of depart or, or, or just kind of take a detour for a moment off the main highway of our subject to a side road of this coarse jesting, because this entire topic got really started by a conversation that one of my daughters was having on a group chat uh, that, that, that they were on coming from a youth camp. And this, this friend of hers had put an acronym, uh, an, you know, inside the group chat that was, that the last word was the F word. It was, it, that, that letter F stood for a curse word. And she couldn't believe it. My daughter was, uh, was blown away that, that they, that nobody said anything in this friend group and they thought that this was okay. So they began to private message and, and, we discovered in this private messaging, her mindset as a new believer was that there's nothing wrong with this. My parents curse every once in a while. There's people at camp that curse, and, and I know ministers that are okay with cursing. And so she began to justify saying, I'm not ungodly just because I curse. And my daughter was trying to explain that, look, we're not saying that you're ungodly, but this action and these words are putting off a frequency that is ungodly. And so uh, I began to get fired up by this because I have heard pastors curse right in front of me, three or four or five pastors I can name uh, over the last 10 years that have cursed when they're off the stage. And I've even heard pastors curse on the stage. It, I don't even understand how we can have gotten to a place where we believe that using profanity that is directly related to worldliness and ungodliness, because it wasn't Christians that came up with uh, profanity. It was the world's way of expressing mostly their anger. Most vulgarity comes from the heart and frequency of anger. Right there should be a huge red flag that we should probably stay away from it. So this, this subject is important because young people are now being taught and mentored, and they're looking around, whether or not we're purposely mentoring them, we're always uh, in leadership, we're always leading someone, and what we say is impacting these young people. This brand new Christian is looking around going, well, everybody else is cursing, so I guess it's okay. And this person, this leader thinks that this person's godly because they're in leadership, but they curse behind closed doors, so it must be okay. And here in lies a slippery slope of compromise that brings our children to no different than the world. Going to church, having a form of godliness, but denying its power because they don't understand Kadosh, which we'll get into in just a moment. Leaders, we need to beware. James 3.1 says this, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that you shall receive a stricter judgment. Now, some of you that are watching this, I know leaders that, that are humble enough and, and they have this philosophy that they're not any better or any different than anyone else. They don't want to be looked at as a leader. Well, brother and sister, and I, if you are in leadership, you're not a regular sheep. You are a sheep with a staff, just like Moses. And because of that, you are blessed greater because your life is on the line. Like Aaron, when he went into the Holy of Holies once a year, all right, his life was on the line. He may not come out if his sins weren't forgiven. So God blessed him more than anybody else uh, because of that. You are judged more strictly because you're leading someone. So you're not the same. You can't do the same things. It doesn't even matter if it's your right and the sheep get the right to do those things. You don't have the same rights. So as leaders, it's really, really important that we recognize that we must set examples for everyone that is listening to us. So your right, and we'll talk about that at the end, our right is, does not give us the ability to make the risk, to take the risk for somebody else. 
Let's read Mark chapter 9, verse 42. This is a great verse. It says, But whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. My friends, listen to this. As a leader, if you're a leader out there, if you're a parent, you're a leader. Everyone's a leader, but specifically those in ministry. If you're in leadership and you exercise your right in this area and you believe it's not a sin to use profanity or whatever the, the topic might even be, you exercise your right, but it causes someone else to sin or fall short of God's glory in a greater way because of your action, better for you to be thrown into the sea with a millstone around your neck, the Bible says. Are you willing to take that risk to exercise your right? You might even believe alcohol is okay, it's fine as long as you don't get drunk. Okay, great. But what happens when a newly, a new teenager gets saved, a teenager gets saved, he's brand new, he comes from a line of alcoholics and he sees you at a campfire, at a church camp out with a beer in your hand and he thinks to himself, I don't know no different. I've never been a Christian in my life. I guess it's okay. He starts to drink and he becomes an alcoholic because he believes that you as a mentor and a leader is supposed to be teaching him, is teaching him it's okay. And you never know that years later, he ends up beating his wife or dies or kills somebody accidentally. And the blood the Bible says is on your head. We cannot exercise our right at someone else's risk expense. We need to let that soak down inside of us because most of us are constantly looking out for our rights, what we want to do, what we can do, and what we can't do. And then we sketch and, and, and skip on the edge of the can't do. We, we ride the wall. We walk on the top of the wall, right on the edge of that fence. Why? Carnality, because we want to do what we want to do. We're rebels at heart. We don't. We don't, we we always discount the power of the of the sin, the law of sin and death in our lives that are constantly pulling us away from God. And when it's a skirt that line, brother, why do we flirt with it at all? What's wrong with staying so far on this side of the of the fence? Oh, well, I don't want someone to think that I'm too good. I can assure you. Love covers, covers a multitude of sins. And you staying on this side and choosing to be holy as he is holy. If the world mocks you for that, then you're probably headed in the right direction. Let's continue. Proverbs 21, 23 says this, Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from trouble. If we guard our mouths, this has nothing to do with profanity either. We need to guard our mouths, protect what comes out. Because what? It keeps your soul from trouble, both on Judgment Day and in this world right now. Matthew 15, 10 says it this way. When he called the multitude to himself, he said to them, listen, hear and understand. That's really important. Hear and understand. Shema, as it said in Hebrew. Hear and obey. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man. But what comes out of his mouth, this is what defiles a man. And in context here, he's talking about uh, washing of hands. And the, and the Pharisees believed that if they ate bread without washing their hands, that it would defile them. He said, look, bread is from God. They, you're so worried about dirt and grime and bacteria that you don't even know of yet because they haven't discovered it. But you don't understand that what comes out of your heart, out of your mouth, that is what's defiling you as a human being. It's the frequency of your heart. God reads thoughts. Our thoughts become a belief system. Belief system becomes actions of who we are and what we are all about. We are judged by our words, Matthew says. By our words, we will be accepted, and by our words, we will be condemned. We would do well to be careful. And this subject is really, really important because kids are involved. And some of you parents, not trying to be angry here, but some of you parents are cursing inside of your own home in front of your children. Don't expect them to love God. 
with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Expect them to be the hypocrite that you are being in front of them. They will model and mimic and repeat everything that you are and what you say and what you do. We are to be the image of God and we are to let no corruption come out of our mouth. First Peter chapter 2, verse 12 says this, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. What is that? The day of Christ Jesus. What's he saying here? He's like, look, make your conduct honorable amongst those that aren't of us. What does that mean? What's he saying? Again, this is part of the heart of God. This is, you you might say, Jim, what does this have anything to do with profanity? Everything. Because this is not about what you believe. It's not about what you think. It's not about the direct scripture that gives you the right or takes away your right or condemns or blesses whether or not you can use profanity in whatever country or time period that you're in. What this is saying is the Gentiles in that area Okay, if you're in Japan, take your shoes off. It's profane to not do so. What's he saying? Respect the culture that you're in. If the Gentiles in that area know that cursing is wrong and the F-bomb is wrong, if you drop the F-bomb in front of these Gentiles, you're going to absolutely give them reason to not love God even more. Because they will say, oh, he's just like us. What a hypocrite. Even the Gentiles, ladies and gentlemen, even unsaved people know and believe that Christians shouldn't, shouldn't curse. Why is this even a topic of discussion? Unbelievers know Christians shouldn't be cursing. So we are dishonoring God by using our right We are dishonoring God in front of the nations, in front of the Gentiles, when we don't watch what we say. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6 says this, Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside the faith, redeeming time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Another incredible verse that's given to us in the book of Colossians, telling us, look, be wise. Understand that there's eyes everywhere. There's ears everywhere listening and looking to everything you do. You know, there's one thing that I learned when I spent five years in a federal prison camp for something that I didn't do. It was a horrible experience. But one of the things that I felt is the eyes and the ears that were around me. When they found out that I was a preacher, didn't take them long to nickname me preacher. And then everyone just sat back and watched. And how do I know this? Because some of them came up to me months later and said, you know, preacher, we've been watching you. I want to see if you're like the other preachers that come in here. Carry your Bible, and then you just do everything that we do. He's like, I noticed that you don't curse. You don't drink, because there's lots of alcohol in prison. You don't do all these other things. You actually live what you believe. I just want you to know we respect you for that. You see, it's our responsibility that we understand and have the wisdom that everyone is watching. So whether or not you feel like scripturally it's okay to curse or if it's a sin or not, understand that someone else might believe that it's wrong because culture says it's wrong. Whether you think it's right or wrong is irrelevant. They believe it's wrong. And the wisdom in refraining from that right will create an opportunity to lead somebody to Christ. And I cannot tell you how many people that I led to Christ in the most darkest of places just because I chose to watch what I say and to live a life of integrity regardless of where I'm at. Luke chapter 6 says this in verse 43, For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, 
An evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Did you hear that last part? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Don't tell me, I had someone tell me recently, they struggle with cursing. They struggle with profanity. I said, no, you don't. You struggle in your heart. This ain't got nothing to do with the rudder. Your whole ship is being, being turned by the rudder, but the rudder has got a, a wooden stick on it that's directly connected to your heart. It's out of your heart that the mouth is speaking. If you have a problem with your speech, it's a heart issue. Now, some people might find this hard to believe, but before I got saved in 1986, I was just a young man and I hung around some people that cursed a lot and I, every other word I said was a curse word. I cursed like a sailor, as they say. There was no getting around it. I couldn't stop cursing if I tried. It became part of my language. When I got saved, there was something that happened in my heart. I was unaware of it. I didn't get saved and, and pray that God would help me with my, my tongue. It naturally began to change because the heart began to change. And my friends, this is where we've got to go. Listen to what I'm about to say. I believe it's from God. God is desiring for his people to stop just looking into his words on the do's and don'ts and start looking into his heart. What is his mind on a subject? What is his heart on a subject? When we know the heart of God, what is the original intent of God? It's to bend man back towards the garden. Everything you say, think, and do should be related to that goal because that is the heart of God, to bend people back to the garden. And the faster that we recognize that, the more that we are consumed with bending people back, the more that our heart begins to get transformed by the renewing of our mind and our words naturally change. When you stubbed your toe, you might come close, but you won't cuss, you won't curse, you won't speak harshly because the heart changes. It's the heart that God's looking for. That's why he said of King David, this is a man after my own heart because he was perfect. This is a murderer and an adulterer. No, David every day raised up early in the morning. He sought after the word of God. He repented of his sin in sackcloth and ashes. He recognized the depravity of his own situation. He didn't have an ego at that point in his life where God said, that is a man after my own heart. He sinned, but he didn't quit. He was in the dust, but he got back up. He fell from the mountain and then he climbed it again. The heart of a man of God is not a perfect man. It's a man who loves the perfect. I don't think the Bible could say it any better than this next set of verses that I've said a thousand times if I had a thousand messages. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. If a man could keep this perfectly, there's no law against these. Not a single law in the Torah stands against the fruit of the Spirit. This is the law, my friends. Almost every topic that we talk about is going to come down, come down to self-control and patience. Most profanity happens because people don't have patience. They have no self-control. They can't modulate. They don't have a bridle. The Spirit, listen, this is going to hurt. The Spirit of the living God is not bridling your, your tongue, perhaps because the Spirit of God is not enough in your mouth. There's too much of your own thoughts coming out. But when you have more of the mind of God, the bridle of God comes into your mouth and now you can be ridden. Now. You're not a maverick. Now, you're not found out in the deserts of New Mexico by yourself as a lone horse. You are worthy to be ridden by the king because you're worthy, because you are willing to have a bridle in your mouth. 
It is our mouth, ladies and gentlemen, that gets us in so much trouble. We are destroying people's lives with our mouth. And we are blessing them at the same time. As we'll get to James, surely this shouldn't be. Proverbs 4, 24 says this, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Some of you struggle in coarse jesting. We shouldn't be joking around about sexual things or anything that is unholy for that matter. It's not funny to God at all. Can you imagine Yeshua, Jesus, making a coarse joke? No, we can't because he wouldn't do that. Whatever is holy, whatever is pure, think on these things because if you think on anything else, it will come out your mouth. Now, I'm wearing a shirt right now. I just feel led to share this with you. This is why I wore this shirt. This is the Hebrew word, Aish, Aleph, Shin. Aleph is the first letter in the Hebrew uh, alphabet. It means in Paleo-Hebrew, the, the strength of a leader, its pictograph was an ox. It was a strong leader. The Shin is by itself can actually be uh, the entire name of God. It's a representation. It's on mezuzahs of, of every Jewish home uh, in the world that has a mezuzah. They'll have the sheen on there. It represents the all-consuming fire, El Shaddai. It's the all-consuming fire of God. It's what landed on the heads of the disciples in the upper room in Acts chapter 2. Interestingly enough, tongues of fire. And so the reason why I put this together, because it, it, the, in the Hebrew, Aleph is the strength of the leader. Sheen is the all-consuming fire. This word literally means fire. That a true leader, the strength of the leader, is the all-consuming fire. A real Bible-based, spirit-filled believer. Its power is in the tongue of God that rests over your head like the, the fireball like the pillar of fire that rested over the tabernacle in the wilderness and said, this is where I will reside. This is my presence for everyone to see for miles around. I'm living right under here. And when that fire, that tongue of fire showed up in Acts chapter two, God was saying the same thing. This is where I choose to reside. I'm giving them a new tongue. It is not a tongue like the world. It is not a tongue that has come close to the world. There's not a language in this world that compares to the real tongue of God. Think of the connection. James says that, that and I'll just read it to you, James chapter 3, 5 through 12, it says, Even so the tongue is a little member, but it boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature itself. And it's set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile, of creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the image of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. My friends, the reason why I chose to wear this shirt is because we are wearing a tongue of fire Everywhere we go, the, cho the choice is up to you whether that tongue becomes to light someone on fire for God or it burns them to the ground and it burns their opportunity to be bent back 
towards the garden, which is our goal in life, to be a light in the wilderness, a light among men, to be the light of the world. And the light starts with the face, and the face is the same Hebrew word for presence. The presence of God creates a glow of God that causes the heart of God uh, to be impregnated inside of you, and then out comes fresh water, the life of the living water of the Word. And here the very universe that was created by the Word, that was defiled by the enemy who manipulated through Word, Adam and Eve, gets to be redone and rebirthed, and the restoration of all things happens through the Word of God through you. It is your words that will change your situation. If you have a horrible marriage, change your words. If you have difficulty connecting with your son or your daughter, change your words. Everything that we do eventually comes out this right through right here. When you get in a situation where you're uncomfortable, stop complaining and look for the positive. God himself might be blessing you through what you think is a curse. You see, leaving all your home and, 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 and everything being stripped from you sounds like a horrible thing, unless you're an Israelite that's being taken out of Exodus and brought to what you don't even know is where you came from. Words mean things. Words matter. Words will change your life. It will light someone on fire for God, or it will light their whole life on fire from hell. Be careful what we say. I love what this says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Paul says this about your right. We talked about this earlier. We have the right to use profanity. It's not, oh, it's not bad. It's all about the heart. Well, this is what Paul has to say, who has the heart of God. Beware that somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. Now, he's talking about a different subject here, but it doesn't matter. Paul's issue is, look, it's the same thing. He's fighting people that want to do something because they feel like they have the right to do it, and it's not wrong to them. And Paul says, it's not about you. Stop living for you. Understand there's people following you. So put aside your right. Sacrifice it for crying out loud. Take the best of your sheep. If you think the best is the best, put it aside for God. So you think it's okay to do this and to use profanity? God says, if you have my heart, you'll put it aside, your right, for the weaker brethren who's following you. Praise God for Paul having the heart of God. And he goes on to say in verse 19 of chapter 9, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant of all that I might win the more. Brothers and sisters, leaders, pastors, youth pastors, bishops, priests, I don't care who's, if you are a servant and a child of the living God, you are, you are not only just following someone, you are leading them as well. And what Paul says is this is, look, no man tells me what to do. I'm free from all the traditions and doctrines of men, but I'm a servant of all so that I might win all the more. You exercise your right might harm like it did this young girl who believes now that cursing is okay because she hears her Christian friends cursing who were taught by their parents, ministers, pastors, that it was okay. And here we lost currently someone from living a life of holiness, a life set on fire by God. Because see, one of the problems with moving into the area of profanity and trying to get all black and white in Bible, which nothing wrong with it. I'm a big Bible guy, as you know. But if we don't do whole Bible and the original intent, the heart of God, we miss everything and what we end up with is creating and teaching and training the next generation. Not just that cursing's okay every once in a while. We're teaching them that compromise is okay. And they'll take that principle and they will unintentionally weave it into, the devil will weave it into every area of their life. There's a reason why God said, this is the line, don't cross it. 
Because the moment you get even close to it, the enemy's voice is louder and louder because he sits on the same fence and he just sits and talks to those who sit next to that fence. Run from the fence and you won't hear the devil speak. I love what Paul says. He ends this whole debate in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 8, 13 by saying, therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I'll never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. The heart of God is so clear. You could change this to any topic. If cursing makes my brother stumble, if exercising what you think is your right makes your brother stumble, then I'll never ever use profanity ever again because I don't want someone to stumble. If exercising my right to drink alcohol will cause someone to stumble, I don't need it because the goal of the kingdom is to bend people back. And I don't want to be on judgment day pointed at by someone in the back of the line that said, well, well, he did it. And, and I thought he was godly. So I, I, I didn't know that, that it wasn't okay. I stumbled because of him, because of her. Brethren, when we live for Christ and Christ alone, and we put down the ego, because that's what this conversation is really about. It's about ego. Some of it's about not understanding. There are some people who legitimately have not thought through this. I get it. But I pray the living God will impact you and impress upon you how important words are. When we, my friends, compromise, it affects our character. And the character, why is it so important? Because it affects the image that you're portraying to everyone around you. When you're harsh with your children, when you're harsh with your wife, when you're harsh with your words, you are showing them a Christ that doesn't exist. And in last week's Torah portion, last week's message, we talked about Moses. I think it was last week or maybe it was the week before. Moses hit the rock twice, couldn't go into the promised land because he portrayed an image of God that wasn't there, that God didn't want him to portray. An image of harsh, angry. No. Words matter. And words will create consequences both good or evil. Now let's talk, as we kind of finish up this, this time together we, we have, let's talk reality and practical. So what about, hopefully, you've come to the conclusion that I, that I believe the heart of God is stay away from that stuff. It ain't worth it. It's not worth the risk. And I believe corruption in each generation, in each general area, no matter where you're at, they define those curse words, stay away from that. It might offend someone. It's just that simple. So maybe you struggle with that. What about substitution words? Because in, you know we have substitution words that are out there, right? Uh, darn and crap and, and freak and so on and so forth. A lot of people use those words. Those words are great if you really struggle with cursing. Using substitution words will help you get away from that. That's how I was able to do it. God allowed me, uh, helped me, I should say, get out of that so many decades ago by using substitution words. Our culture does not look at substitution words as curse words. Now, if you are, uh, if you are using acronyms, people are required by their brain to translate the acronym into their head. So if you're using an acronym, that has a curse word attached to it, then uh, it's probably not okay because that other person's going to have to translate that in their head, right? But if I say that, oh, darn, I've left my keys in the car, I don't believe anybody is going to translate in, that, in, in their head. But there's a better way to say that, and that's not to use that word at all. So I think there's a good, better, best. The best thing is not to use those descriptive words, but it's far better than using what the, the world around us and the traditional Christian kingdom says is actual profanity. 
I'll never forget uh, when I was in my higher learning facility and I'm surrounded by people that are dropping F-bombs and cursing all the time. And I used alternative words and they began to notice it. it. It stuck out like a sore thumb. They noticed it and immediately uh, began to respect me and recognize that, oh, this guy's the real deal. Even when he's pushed really hard, he's not letting, he's not cursing like we are. And uh, I'll never forget, uh, there was one individual that just kept cursing around me and another guy came up, uh, that, it was a friend of mine, and said, hey man, stop effing cursing around preacher. And he's like, oh, wait a minute, sorry about that. Right? So they re we will respect you and recognize if you do use uh, alternative words, people will recognize that a as a good thing, not necessarily a negative thing. But you got to be careful who you're doing around. You may not want to do that around young kids. You may not want a young child uh, to be saying even the alternative words. Now, I know everyone has heard this phrase. Everyone's heard this phrase. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That might be one of the largest lies that Satan has ever put into the Christian community because it's not true. Words absolutely destroy. I'd rather somebody hit me and break my jaw than say something that would break my heart. First Peter 1 15, 16 says this, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it's written, be holy as I am holy. And you may or may not be familiar with the Hebrew word here, kadosh, but it means to be set apart. You're not supposed to look like the world. We're not supposed to come down. Some people say, you know, I, I want to be more relatable. I heard one pastor say this on, on, online. I want to be relatable to people. So I'm okay with certain kinds of profanity as long as I'm not hurting someone's feelings uh, because I want people, I want to relate to the world so that I can win more of the world. What? If the, it, well, might as well just hold up a Playboy magazine to relate to the world. You might as well look at porn because 88% of men are looking at porn today. So you, you might as well do all kinds of things to relate to the world. No, we don't relate to the world by doing worldly things. We already relate to the world and all their pain and their suffering. What we're trying to do is get them to relate to Christ. Talk to the inner man, not the outer man. The outer man is fake. It's a fraud. Everyone is hurting. They got voids. They got gaps inside of them. We don't need to do the outer man. We're not trying to attract the outer man. We're trying to speak to the inner man that's starving, hungry, and begging for someone to share the gospel with them in a way that's authentic and real. And as we end here, I just want to show you a few memes that I thought were very powerful that I saw online. It spoke to me, and I think they'll speak to you. Take a look at this one. It says, before you speak, let your words pass through three gates. Is it true? Is it necessary? And is it kind? We have to memorize that, brothers and sisters. Is it true? Is it necessary? And it's kind. Because there's things that are true that you, it's not necessary to say. And there's things that are true and necessary, but they may not be kind. It has to pass all three of those. Take a look at the second one. I like this one. Don't mix bad words with your bad mood. You'll have many opportunities to change a mood, but you will never get the opportunity to replace the words you have spoken. When the words come out, they create and they destroy. If God speaks the word destroy, the earth is gone and none of us will even know it. He created the universe just like that. When you speak words, they go out in the universe. They never come back. That's why God says, my words will never return void. And we're made in his image. When you speak, the universe is listening. God is listening. People are listening. You can change your attitude, but you can't change what you said. So better when you're angry, say nothing. And the last one is this, be careful with your words. Once they are said, they can only be forgiven, not forgotten. As a pastor and minister for many years, I can assure you, I have done so much counseling and deep counseling and deliverance and healing with people. And the number, I think probably number one trauma is the words that were spoken to them 
as a child. You see, this topic, although it starts off with profanity, it ends with everything that we say because the heart of God is not zeroing in on curse words. He's concerned not just about the frequency of your heart, but the frequency of your heart as it relates to other people being bent back towards the kingdom. Are you more concerned about someone else than yourself? Are you willing to put aside your right to not put someone else at risk? What you do in private will end up in public. So even if nobody else is there, do it for God so that you train your heart to be pure and holy. You might say, Jim, you have no how far, how, how far I've come. I used to be a cursor. It doesn't matter how far you've come. The goal is Christ. That's our litmus test. That's the temperature gauge. That's the foundation of everything that we are. We don't balance ourselves against the world or even who we used to be and give ourselves a thumbs up for how far we've come. What we should be doing is waiting for God to give us a thumbs up to say, you are a good and faithful servant. Enter in now. You held the line. And by the way, thank you for giving up your right to make sure that someone else came into my kingdom and were bent just a little bit more back towards the garden. My friends, words matter. They impact. They can light people on fire or they can be lit on fire by hell itself. Be careful what you say, what you think, and what you do. You're made in the image and you're mirroring what you see. May we mirror the living God and be gentle and kind and express the living God through what we say. Would you consider praying with me right now if you struggle in this area, in any area that the Holy Spirit has convicted you? Can we just close in prayer together and join with me? Father, we use our words right now and we just ask that you would forgive us for the things that we have said that have been harsh. Our thoughts, our, our non-alignment doctrines with you and your heart on this issue. That, Father, you're not looking for perfection. What you're looking for us is to seek to be perfect as you are perfect, to be holy as you are holy, to run from the wall of separation between good and evil. Father, we lay down our motives, our hearts, our agendas, and our rights. And we ask that you would take us into a new place, a fresh place where only clear, clean, pure, fresh water comes out of our mouth. At all times, God, help us to put your bridle in our mouth so that you can take us where we need to be. It's oftentimes, Lord, we beg for you to show us direction, but we're not willing to let your spirit put the bridle in our mouth. Could there be a connection between our prayers being answered and the bridle? Father, thank you for your word and the entirety of it. I bless the people of God right now in Yeshua's name and ask that you would be with them in this issue. Transform their worlds by the words that come out of their mouth. Amen. My friends, thank you for joining us in this week's broadcast. You can visit us at passionfortruth.com and uh, also please continue to uh, comment down below. Let us know what you think about this message. Did it impact you? What parts uh, made a difference in your life? What hit you? What didn't hit you? Agree, disagree? And then share this message with others. It's the best way to give us a compliment. We are grateful to be in your lives. Thank you for partnering with us financially. You can do that at passionfortruth.com as well. We are always trying to, uh, to, to affect uh, our world around us, and you are the greatest asset that we have. Thank you for your prayers and your support, my friends. We'll see you next time. Shalom.